Welcome everybody. I know we've got people joining um, fast and furiously, which is great. Um, but I'm just going to run through housekeeping as usual, which hopefully many of you will um, know our kind of housekeeping etiquette for this morning. Um, so if we can ask people to please mute your lines and turn off your videos um, until you're asking a question or entering into the discussion, that would be great. Um, if you have the raise your hand function, um, please do use it in order to ask a question or give feedback. Um, obviously, if you haven't got that function and we appreciate that not everybody does, please feel free to put um, comments, questions in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, and we'll take questions throughout uh, the session this morning. Um, and obviously, please use the, the chat function as previously mentioned. If you can add your name role organisation that just helps um, us to know who it is that's uh, commenting. That would be very helpful. OK, next slide, please. So um, welcome to everybody for our seventh webinar um, in our series of webinars. Um, most of you, I'm sure, will know me by now, but I'm Liz Cullen, um, Head of Clinical Programme for Maternity and Perinatal Mental Health for Hampshire and Thames Valley, and currently working on the South East um, Maternity Cell with our regional and Kent Surrey Sussex um, colleagues. Um, we've got uh, a really good agenda today. Um, we're lucky enough to have Giles Beresford from the national team as National Clinical Director joining us today to give a national update um, and obviously our focus today is thinking about the long term plan and um, getting back into kickstarting our delivery of the long term plan post COVID. Um, after Giles and we've um, scheduled time after Giles's presentation in order to, ha to have questions and discussion because I'm sure there will be lots um, from people. Then we will move on to Yelena, um, who's kindly joining us from Birmingham and Sullyhole Mental Health Trust. Um, and she will be talking about the analysis of mental health and IAPT activity for women within the perinatal period. Um, and that's a really great presentation from her that I'm looking forward to. Um, then we will move on to our collaborative session, um, again, looking at restoration and recovery. So highlight the good practice um, that you all um, kindly gave us in our session um, a fortnight ago and then thinking about moving forward in terms of the long term plan and also we discussed in our webinar fortnight ago we're going to um, revisit the frequency of these um, webinars and give you the, the opportunity to mm -hmm. vote on that. Okay. So I'm going to move swiftly on to Giles. Um, Giles, thank you for joining us this morning to give the national update. Um, I believe Giles may be having a little bit of difficulty with sound, or is Giles okay now? Yeah, I'm okay, I think. Oh, fantastic. Oh, you okay. can hear me, I'm okay. <laughs> yes, that's lovely. Okay, Excellent. I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Giles. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, well, I'm still in my office, but yeah, never mind. Um, so yeah, so I'm Giles Beresford. I'm the so, uh, no, I'm not. I'm the national specialty advisor now for NHS England for perinatal mental health. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also a perinatal psychiatrist working in Birmingham. So I work on the Birmingham Mother and Baby Unit. So it's a bit of a Birmingham day today. So uh, that's great that you've got both me and Yelena. And um, I was asked really to just talk a little bit about where, where are we up to from a national perspective. So what's happening from NHS England and what's been happening in terms of the long term plan, but also thinking about the response that we've had to COVID. Now, I suppose COVID has sort of is, is completely and utterly taken over all of our lives uh, for the last few months. And as a result, that's had an enormous impact on, on where we progressed with the long term plan. And I think it's really important that we try to hold both of those things in mind. Think about we are still in the middle of COVID, hopefully on the tail end of it, but but we're still in the middle of it, really. Um, and we also have to start thinking about the long term plan and what we can do next. And, but the two are not distinguishable. You can't just do one without the other. We, we we now need to move forward, combining both of those bits together. I think over the last few months, we've had uh, an enormous lot of, of work has gone on, um, most of that at a very local level. So I think all of you have been working incredibly hard. And I think I, I'm constantly amazed by how quickly 
things have happened and what people have done in a really short space of time to respond to the challenges that we've had. And I think it's um, it is amazing. And I think it's really worth just taking some time out to reflect how amazing that has been um, and also how hard everyone has been working um, and to, to recognise that 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 can't go unacknowledged. I think it, we, we, we need to, everyone needs to know that we've been through an extremely traumatic time over the last few months. It has enormous impact upon our services, but also on all of us personally. Um, and then to move forward into the long term plan is another huge challenge. But I don't think we can just take away straight across. I think it does need a bit of space to just reflect and, and recognise that people have been doing an awful lot of work. Uh, so thank you all very much for doing so much work. I'm, I'm amazed by what, by, what, by all of you and what you've been doing. Um, if I no, go to my next slide, um, I'm going to give you some of the, the, the official slides, I suppose. So this is the stuff that we've been talking about uh, from a national perspective for a while. Um, and so the big thing at the moment is talking about restoration and recovery. Um, I think it's a bit of a misnomer. I don't think this is really restoration. I don't think we ever stopped. So the reality is, is that all of you have been working very hard throughout the, the entire COVID pandemic. So, so I think it's important to recognise that it's it's not it's not restoring. It's not that we're restarting. We, people have carried on working all the way through, but it's just trying to reflect on what do we need to do next? How do we recover? And what does that look like into the future? And I think we still need to do quite a lot of work from an NHS England point of view to to model what it is that, that the situation looks like. We, we anticipate that there's going to be an enormous increase in demand for, for mental health, learning disability and autism services generally, but also specifically for perinatal mental health. And so we need to look at how that models and uh, what will that look like? And then we need to, to overlay that onto our LTP ambitions to make sure that the two match up and to make sure that what we thought we needed by 2023, 2024 is still what we need or, or do we indeed need even more because we think that actually services will uh, it will have had such an impact on on services that we will need to expand even more than we were doing previously. Um, and so, so that's something that we, we just need to be aware of. Can we go to the next slide. I will let you have these slides, so, so feel free to, to share them. Um, and I think it's really that they're just there as a, a guide as to what we've officially been saying, I suppose. And these are still very much the, the key messages. Um, I suppose what we hoped is that we would be publishing something by, by June. It's now the 1st of July. We've not quite done this, but we want to update our planning guidance and, and give a, a clear idea of exactly what it is that we need to do. And I think the fact it's not being done is it's just that it, People are working very hard to make it happen, but we need to make sure it's accurate, don't we? In the meantime, what we've said very clearly is that people should be continuing to, to strive for, for, for what they were going to do in 2020, 2021, as best as they can. And so thinking about what the ambitions were, thinking about what we said we would do from the long term plan, and then think about, well, how can we still work towards that? What What's still possible uh, to do? So if we were going to recruit people during this time, then and we ought to be thinking about well, actually, can we still recruit them? What does that look like and how does that help us to work towards LTP deliverables at the moment? So what can we still be, be doing? Um, we, we need to make sure that we, we've got the investments there. So, so there's still a commitment from NHS England that all of the money, which they said would be going down into CCG baselines, is still there. It's just that things have been put on hold to some extent, simply because we had to move things along really quickly. People had to respond to the pandemic in March, which is just before the new contracts could be signed. And so we needed to have a holding position, if you like, to say, look, this is how we, we fund things going forward. But there's still a very clear commitment from NHS England that that money will, for the long term plan will still be going down into CCG baseline. So it's still there. And so what we expect is, is for local services to still be working towards the development, which they said that they would be doing as best as they can. Um, and also thinking that actually we, we inequalities was always going to be a big issue for this year. And I think what we've seen, unfortunately, with COVID is that those inequalities are even greater than they ever were. And so we need to make sure that when we are starting our recovery process, that we make sure that anything that we're doing addresses those inequalities. Can we go to the next slide? I think as we go to the next slide, what this, the next slide is really saying is, is that actually we're in a really good position to be doing all of these things. And I think the whole response to, um, to, to COVID and what's been happening over the last few months has only been possible in perinatal mental health because we have had such excellent local leadership. And so clinical networks like this one and clinical networks across the country have worked incredibly hard to make sure that um, the, the voice of women and services is being noted and we can understand what what is actually happening locally and so it's been utterly invaluable and so 
so so Jenny, your your clinical lead, Jenny Walsh, has, has been joining our uh, leadership meetings on a weekly basis just to make sure that that we, we we stay as up to date as possible because one of the difficulties that we have is data. And so actually waiting for the real data to come through can take a little bit too long. And so what we've been relying on is actually local uh, communities, local services actually telling us what's happening so that we can start to think, well, this is how we need to be responding. We need to make sure that that, that local data is borne out and the national data. But so far, it looks as though that's exactly what will happen. So this is really just to say a very big thank you to, to all the, the, the local leaders who've been doing so much hard work. Um, but also to say that it has actually put us in a really strong place to, to think about how we move forward and think about what, what we can be doing on a national level to, to recover appropriately and also how we navigated our way through the, the whole pandemic situation. So thank you very much. Uh, so we go to the next slide and then just think specifically on the next slide about the perinatal mental health and COVID and what's been happening. And so it has obviously, as I keep on saying, it's been a time of enormous change and there's been risks to everyone. So to our existing patients, to the new patients that have been referred into our service and to our staff who who continue to work in those services. And so I think, it, again, it's just important that we reflect that the enormous amount of, of, of change and uh, development has happened already. So thank you for, for all the hard work that's already happened. Um, we, we we already know that, that, that it's not just the, the code is not just the virus which is problematic but it's also all the associated governments that went with that so all the the government lo lockdown the impact that that's had on people's general well-being the impact that it's had on maternity services and how they deliver care and the impact that that has upon um women's birthing experiences and families birthing experiences and and what that's what those early parenting experiences have been like everything has changed fairly dramatically uh, throughout all of that time um we expect that this would have an enormous impact upon women who've already got uh, very serious mental health problems anyway, but also it'll have an impact on, on anyone who's going through that process. And so, so it's just reflecting how it's really important now that services respond to that uh, and support women who have been through a very unexpected and difficult time. Um, and as I've said, so, so our services, community services did remain open. They've continued to, to be open for business. They've continued to see patients, uh, but in a different way. And so it's thinking about how things have changed as a result of that. So and, and that's been stressful as well. So it's been stressful for the women, but it's also been stressful for staff. So, so seeing women in a very different way in, in terms of seeing video interactions or telephone contact, working from home, not being able to have as much eyes on contact, not being able to assess mother infant interaction in the same way. All of those things have been very different in the community, whilst the inpatient MBUs are completely different. So reducing visiting time, reducing uh, the ability to have leave from the ward, ability to, to visit home and have that graded leave and prior to discharge. The interaction between staff and patients and babies, again, all of these things have been altered. And so it has been a, a time of very enormous, great change, which has been stressful, I think, for everyone. If we go to the next slide, it's just really to a reminder, I suppose, of what we said right at the beginning of all of this. So, so Claire Murdoch sent a letter back in, I think it was April or May, so, so certainly earlier this year, this year, everything's sort of merged into one, I'm afraid. Um, but basically just saying that we, we ought to be preparing for, for this possible increase in demand, that we expect that that, that things are going to, to get busier because we know that this is very stressful and this is going to have an impact on everyone. Um, we, we definitely increased the amount of digital and non-face-to-face -face assessments, but then we had to balance that against well what is the actual risk to those patients if they're not being seen and, and making sure that this is done in a sensible way so we couldn't just transfer everyone to being non-face-to-face -face. we couldn't transfer everyone to being digital some people have to be seen um, we, we need to make sure that we're still collecting our data so that we've got some idea of what's actually happening um, and, and so we I was asking people to, to continue to submit to the mental health service data set um, and we also knew that actually what the way that we're working now is very different from how we've worked previously. So it's just think about how do we adapt our skills? So we were never, I was never trained to do a webinar like this, for example. I've never trained to, to talk through a computer uh, to you guys, it's just as you guys haven't been trained to talk to patients through a computer. So, so there's all these things which are different. And so it's just thinking about what is it that we need to do to support staff so that we can start to develop those things. Feedback very much appreciated, by the way. So thank you. But um, yes, yeah, so, so so we need to, to make sure that we continue to, to develop and grow, don't we, to make sure that we can we can run these services. 
and locally it was just thinking well what what does your local service look like so thinking specifically that if we are having this increase in demand then is that reflective of all of your communities where you live? Are we making sure that we're not exacerbating inequalities further? Are we making sure that everyone is having equal access to the care that they need when they need it? Um, how can we make sure that that's been done? Are there, I think the, the key question is, is there local educational needs that you have? And certainly I think having a, that conversation with HEE would be really important and perhaps and well, I'm fairly sure HE would love to, to come to one of these webinars just to talk to you a little bit about well, what are your, your educational needs? Is there something that we can do to support you in terms of developing into the future? So I think these are the, the local questions, I think, which still need to be answered uh, and still being explored. Should we go to the next slide? And really, we, we're just thinking in the next slide about planning for, for what happens next. Um, and really, Claire was, was, was again giving the message that actually the LTP is, is still important and so we still need to be planning for it and that's not going to change. The LTP is not going away. So although it's being reviewed, it's simply being reviewed to make sure it still meets all of the needs that we expect it to meet. Um, it's not going to be downgraded. It's not going to, the, the ambitions are not going to change. It's just about what what's the timing of all of this. Are there certain bits of our flexible ambitions which perhaps need to be brought in even quicker? And so think one of the things that I often think about is that there's now a whole cohort of women who, who feels as though they've missed out. And so there are women who've not been identified by their health visitor. It's you know, six months or, or nine months postpartum. And by the time they do get identified, then they'll have had the whole three, four months of, of this uh, isolation period in COVID. And technically they would they would miss out. They would have missed the, the 12 month cutoff point. And given that one of our ambitions is to increase access up to 24 months, is this a cohort that we should be saying, actually, we need to think about how we can implement this flexible ambition sooner rather than later to make sure that these women don't have the, the double whammy effect of missing out because of COVID and then missing out because we've not implemented the 24 month ambition sooner rather than later. And so, so I think that's something that, that we, we need to, to think about. We need to think about whether well, our other ambition was thinking about the, the needs of partners. And again, that's changed, hasn't it? So partners not even being initially not even allowed into maternity departments for a period of time, then that, that was pretty major and that will have an impact upon their mental state. And so is that something else that we need to be thinking about? One of our flexible aims is it something that we ought to be bringing forward for some people. Actually, we ought to be assessing the, the needs of partners from, from a mental health perspective and making sure that they are directed appropriately. Our, another one of our flexible aims is making sure we've increased access to psychological therapies. Are there certain psychological therapies which we, we know we're going to need more of and therefore we should be training and implementing those therapies sooner rather than later? So the whole period has been really traumatic. Is there going to be an increase in, in trauma responses and therefore should we be thinking about trauma intervention? Should we be thinking more about training more women, uh, more staff in EMDR, etc. to make sure that those little those bits of the flexible ambitions are actually brought in sooner rather than later. And I'm going to talk about the maternal mental health services or the maternity outreach clinics in a bit more detail in a minute as well. So, so I think all of those things that are really important, they're important questions that we need to think about. Well, actually, I'm going to talk about maternal mental health services now. So, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'll tell you about what happened. So, so this was another one of our main ambitions and so the key bit of the, the maternal mental health services or the maternity outreach clinics as we formally call them but we've now changed their name to maternal mental health services um is that we were going to sort of have this is brand new it was completely innovative and it was responding to the five-year forward view where we recognized there were some women and families who were falling through the gaps and we were going to ask the question of how do we fill that gap what can we do to fill that gap and because it was new and innovative we said that we would roll it out by keeping the money central for the first two years and having early implementers and fast followers so that we could learn from those early implementers, find out what works and then share that knowledge with the fast followers to make sure that we can have maternal mental health services which are fit for purpose, looking after those women who have moderate to severe mental health problems but for whatever reason don't end up having a baby at the end of their, their, their maternity pro, uh, uh, period and so so that's what we were hoping to do we got quite a long way we managed to, to do a lot of the, the groundwork and then covid happened and so we were up to the point where the final review of the expression of interest documents was was being completed we we're about to be signed off and then we stopped because of COVID and we recognised that there was just no room in the in the system really to, to be applying for these things because everyone suddenly became extraordinarily busy. What we This is the initial timeline that you can see in front of you. 
And the plan now is to think, well, actually, should we just move it down a quarter? Should we be thinking now that we've just started quarter two? Could we use this as being quarter one? Is this the time to be launching our call for proposals and thinking about maternal mental health systems and services uh, across the country now? And actually still having our early implementers and then having our, our fast followers coming online for, for early next year. So, so that's still still pretty much there and that's still something that we, we need to, to be thinking about and we want people to be getting ready towards putting a, a case together as to what they would want to develop locally. But I can ask, I can answer questions about that. I, I think that might come up. If you go on to the, the next slide, it's just thinking. Oh, oh I know what that slide is. Yeah, so it's just this, this is a lovely slide. So it's just a reminder, I think, of uh, the long term plan. Um, and just recognising, well, what were we trying to do and what are we still trying to do? It feels like ages ago, doesn't it, when, when this was the, the centre of our lives and it's sort of moved off that for a little bit, but it's, it's going to have to, it will come back. Um, and it's recognising that there is a real commitment to give millions of extra pounds to perinatal mental health services. So, and build on the tremendous developments which have happened as part of the five year forward view and to fill in the gaps that we continue to identify as a result of, of developing the five year forward view for perinatal mental health. What we saw when we developed the perinatal mental health services across the country is that they are brilliant and that we attract lots of brilliant staff to work in those departments and that they help thousands of women every single year. But the reports we were getting back from community teams is that there were still women that they thought that they could still offer uh, additional support to and that they felt that they were that the threshold for, for accessing their team was, was almost too high. There was something that about that they could do more should they be given more resources. Specifically, they felt there was a need for further psychological interventions. There was a need to assess the needs of partners. Um, there was a, a need to think more about mother infant interaction. There was a need to, to help those women who end the maternity process without their baby at the end of it, but still have moderate to severe mental illnesses. And, and it was anticipated that up to about 10% of women who give birth each year ought to be accessing an aspect of these teams. And so that was the ambition of the long term plan was to gradually increase the amount of access. And that ends up being our fixed um, target simply because that's the easiest thing for us to measure. But the, the flexible targets that we've already talked about are still just as important, but we wanted to give flex to the local system to decide, well, when would you implement it? And that's the bit that I'm saying now we ought to be doing in view of COVID. We can't take it in isolation. We have to think about what the impact of COVID has been. And so gradually we want to be increasing the number of, of women that are accessing our services and the families who are, who are gaining excellent care from those services until we get to, at the moment, that the, the timeline is still pretty much the same. Uh, and that, and that's because it's important. We don't want women and families to be missing out. So we want to, to, to try and push on this as best we can. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll be taking questions. So let's move on to, to the next bit. So the next slide really is thinking, well, how do you understand well, what, what have you got? So in terms of the money and the funding for all of this, so we've got the, the big high level numbers, but what you really need to know is actually on an STP level, what is your share of that money? How much money do you actually Of money that we expect for each uh, STP and CTG to, to be receiving. And then also we had the Apparently, I keep Charles, I think yeah. we've just missed yeah. that last bit. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether that was my computer or not, but it's obviously for others. Could you just repeat your last bit? Thank you. Yeah, so up to the indicative tool bit. Yeah, I'll go from there. So, yeah, so so we so it's just reminding really that, that this indicative tool came out quite a long time ago now, and it basically tells you how much money is allocated to your STP. It's an indication of what you could expect to receive at an STP and at a CCG level. Um, so hopefully um, that, that's helpful. It's also got a, a workforce tool, an indicative workforce tool, but again, it's indicative. It's not saying this is what it has to look like. It's just saying that this is this may be the, the types of, of people that you want to recruit in order to make sure that you can meet the ambitions of the, the long term plan. 
so, so that's yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. Um, I will move on if that's OK. I think the other thing that I was saying was that um, we, we can't take the LTP. We can't take that in isolation anymore. We've got to combine it together with the, our response to COVID. And so it's got to be thinking that that the world has changed, whether we like it or not, things are different. And we need to make sure that the ambitions of the long term plan fit in with what we now know about COVID. And so COVID has unfortunately shown us that there, is, there are disparities in risk. We know that there are certain communities which are more likely to have adverse effects from, from uh, COVID. And we also know that that level of inequality is something which was already there in our populations anyway. And so it's exacerbated the inequalities which were already present. And so we need to make sure that all of the changes which have been happening, and we know that with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and all of the, those changes which are happening nationally anyway, we, we want this to be an important part of, of, of addressing any inequalities that we see. And we need to make sure that any of our LTP plans has this at the heart. We want to be reducing it, those inequalities. Uh, I think it's something that we were committed to before COVID. But I think COVID has simply made us even more committed to it to make sure that, that we, we're meeting the needs of the whole population. We, we've had report after report after report coming out showing us that there are certain populations which have got very poor outcomes from a maternity point of view, from a mental health point of view, and that's likely the same from a perinatal mental health point of view as well. And so we want to make sure that any sort of developments that we make are addressing those inequalities to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the population we're looking after. OK, let's go to the next slide. Which is sort of probably near near the end, and then we can ask, ask, go for some questions. But um, this slide really is just everyone loves a graph. So, so it's just to show you a little bit of the data that we have got. So a lot of the information that we've had is fairly anecdotal. So it's information that we've had from our clinical leads meeting. This is the bit of the, the national data that we've got so far, which is sort of bearing out what we, we heard uh, locally. And what this shows is, is that 23rd of March, date that, that lockdown commenced, there was a huge decrease huge decrease. There was a large decrease in the, the, the amount of referrals which were coming into our system. Um, and that sort of matched on to what you might expect happens on an annual basis uh, just before Christmas. So we expect to have a, a decrease in referrals at that point. Um, and then what we know is that almost invariably after Christmas is that there's, we overcompensate. So we have a, an increase in referrals in the, in the January, uh, early February period. And so given that that's the information that we already know, that every time there's a dip in uh, referrals, there's an overcompensation afterwards, then that's sort of what we expect to happen anyway now, regardless of all the things which I've already talked to you about, which is saying that actually COVID will have a negative impact upon people's mental state anyway. And so this is part of the reason why we expect there to be a sudden upturn. And this is already being borne out locally. So the anecdotal information that we're getting back is actually that services are having an increase in the number of referrals and so so they are sort of compensating if you like for, for this decrease um, and but we don't know the full extent of how much they are compensating by so i think it's it's just to say that the national data is covering exactly what we found out locally and we expect it to sort of catch up with, with where we're at and i suppose it just gives us a, a better way of quantifying exactly what the, those changes are going to be so we will hopefully come back and show you what the the slide looks like, but I think we, we just need to be preemptive and say, well, actually, we are anticipating a, a, an upsurge in referrals, and therefore we need to, and, and that's likely to be sustained for a period of time, and therefore we need to make sure that we we are able to meet that that upsurge and we're able to carry on working. Um, the next few slides really are just to say uh, about various uh, webinars that have been going on. So, so trauma informed care is something which I feel very strongly about. I think is really important. I think it's the, the way forward in terms of, of the services that we should be offering, uh, that they should be trauma informed. Um, and, and so as a result of that, we, we've done it. We, we, we've commissioned some work. So we've got a, a couple of papers which are going to be coming out. Think about trauma informed care during the perinatal period. Think about how that works in a maternity setting, but also what that looks like in a, a mental health setting. Um, and so so they will come out. Uh, unfortunately, things have been delayed in terms of them being published but they will come out. As a result of that delay, we ended up doing a webinar. So if you just go to the next slide for me, we, we had a webinar which is available on the Futures Forum, which was looking specifically at trauma-informed care. Uh, again, it'd be useful, I think, to, to, to listen to it if you have the time. 
Um, and then the final webinar that we did was about domestic violence and abuse. So if you just flip over to the to the last slide from from me, uh, there's a domestic violence and abuse webinar, which is also still available on the the futures platform as well. And this was simply reflecting what we kept on hearing from our clinical leads meetings, which is that the amount of domestic violence was, was going rising and rising. And it was even more difficult than before to manage simply because we didn't have that face to face contact. And so it's think about how do we actually manage that? And so that's why we ended up doing that webinar on the 18th of May. So, so that's the final webinar, which is just on the next slide. Um, and that sort of brings me to the end. That's it. And that brings me to the end of, of what I was going to say. So um, I think that gives us about seven minutes or so for, for discussion. So I'm sorry if I've talked a bit longer than I thought. But um, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, Jazz. We've got some flexibility on our timings today, so um, if there's cool. more questions we could take them. Um, can we open up the floor really to questions for Giles? Questions, comments? Uh, Dan has got his hand raised. Um, yes, hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, um, Giles. So Dan Knowles, I'm the Chief Exec Officer of Oxfordshire Mind. Um, my my question is about where partners can fit into this. You mentioned uh, partners in your presentation, and great to hear the context of the LTP and post COVID and all of the rest. And I and I just wonder what where you feel the best practice nationally is in the work of the third sector engaging in perinatal mental and their perinatal mental health services, and and where we might be considering um, being involved in the months and years ahead. Yeah, so I think the third sector's got an enormous role in this particular aspect of the, of the long term plan. So so certainly from a Birmingham perspective, so my local team, then our plan for addressing that area is to think that we've done really well in terms of having peer support workers as part of our team. They've been incredibly helpful uh, for, for women who are accessing our, our services. We know traditionally, for, so from our experience, it's been really difficult to engage partners. So the majority of partners are men. Uh, men are more difficult to engage. They're less likely to seek help. Um, they're less likely to attend groups, all those sorts of things. So we know that when we've tried to, to resolve it in the past, it's been difficult. And so the solution that we're, we're going to try next is think about how we do that with a third sector organisation. So we've got a charity called Casia, who works in Birmingham, which has been looking at, so it's, we've got an organisation called Casia Dads, which is a subset of uh, Casia, which is going to change to Casia Partners. Uh, and, and the point of that really is to think about how we employ perhaps a peer support worker, specifically um, a partner with lived experience who can actually support other partners and think about how they, they can work together. And I think that's the model which has worked really well from a peer support worker for, for our women. And so I would hope that it would work well for our, our dads as well. And then the aim for that is, is to recognise that our aim is, is rather than taking over their care, it's to give them an opportunity of having an assessment and then to help them to signpost them to, to appropriate interventions where they, they may need it. Um, and so, so I think that's a one way of trying to engage them better. So that's what we're trying to do from a Birmingham perspective. I think it'd be really exciting to see how it happens across the country. So I think different areas will will have different links. They're not everyone's got an Acacia, which is fine. So, so it'll be interesting to see how everybody else uh, does it. But I think um, it'll be difficult if it's just all stays in house. I think almost you need. I think it's a, an area where you do actually need to work with a partner organisation of some sort to to help with that engagement. Does that help, Dan? Sorry, Dan. Do you? Is there anything you want to come back with that? Thank you so much. I, I sort of don't want to dominate the conversation because it's such yeah. a broad topic. I, funnily enough, I was using the word partner in terms of third sector partner to the NHS, but your answer is, is oh, brilliant. Sorry. No, it's brilliant because it's an area I hadn't previously uh, considered. I mean, you know, we are obviously involved in local services, very, very, um, you know, passionate about perinatal mental health. So I was asking a question in a more broad sense about how the third sector can engage, but actually you've given me a brilliant uh, concept into partners with the other use of the term partner so I'm going to investigate that so thank you. Sorry Dan I misunderstood yeah but more broadly then I think um, I, yeah so third sector partners thinking about um, working with, with various charities in Birmingham it's been amazing it's been really helpful so we've ended up working with more than one so we've got Acacia 
We've got another one which is approachable parenting, which works specifically with the Muslim community in Birmingham, and then APP, Action on Postpartum Psychosis, which specialises with women who suffer from the most severe forms of perinatal mental illness, postpartum psychosis. And so, so it is, I think it's having that range of, of, of uh, those set of partners is actually really helpful for us. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Giles, it's Jenny here. Hi, Jenny. Um, hi. Um, so I'm asking a couple of questions that have sort of come past me recently, just for clarity. Um, so moving towards the women at between 12 and 24 months, um, can you just clarify that we're talking about new presentations as well as women that are already with specialist services? Yeah, so, so I think specifically we, we, we need to recognise that the community perinatal mental health teams are specialised teams that can look after women in the perinatal period of perinatal mental health difficulties and we don't want to, to move away from that, So, which, it, which makes it problematic So, and I know that we've discussed it before Jenny, but from my perspective what I think is that we ought to be thinking that what is it that this team can offer which no other team can do? So is there a, a particular issue about the mother-infant interaction? Is there something here which which we could be supporting them with. Is this, is this an illness which is just happens to have been caught really late? So we know that there's always presentation of women who have struggled on and on and on for 12 months and then they get referred in at the moment we're saying no to them. I think we need to, I think we need to be really clear that this is a perinatal mental health difficulty of some sort and we are the best team to re resolve them. I accept that however, that the difficulty with that is that it's less cut and dry, so it's not very black and white. Uh, and I accept that that will need quite a lot of negotiation with in terms of what CMHTs think we do and how we work with our CMHT mm -hmm. colleagues to make sure that we, we make that work in the future. But I do think we need to preserve what is the specialism of, of the perinatal mental health team. I don't think we can get diluted into just being basically a CMHT for women who happen to have a baby under the age of two. I don't think that will, I don't, I think we'll drown if we try and do that. I think we need to think, well, what is it about us which we can do specifically for that woman? What is our role in that context rather mm. than just keeping people? That's really helpful. And I think it might be a piece of work for the network to help with about how, because I think specialist teams talk about perinatal specific and know what they mean by that. But I actually think it's quite a difficult concept to get across to other services. So yeah. if we can capture that somehow and and um, and in a way that's understandable, I think that would be a really good piece of work to do to 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 capture that definition. Yeah, I think I agree. I, I would welcome that definitely, Jenny. Thank you. And my, did you have another question, Jenny? I did. I had another one. You know me. I always have another one. Um, <laughs> So um, my other one was about dads and we know uh, we're knowing a lot more about dads and partners mental health um, in the perinatal period. So if the maternal mental health services are offering birth trauma work, could we offer that to tra dads who'd been traumatised by the birth they'd witnessed? Um, so uh, I think you... Mm. So, so I think there's definitely room for couples work. So thinking about the, the the pair together doing some work. I think if it's just the dad in isolation, then no, probably not. But I think if it's, it's if you think okay. about the family's unit, then then yeah, I think it's important that we we think about who who could best meet his needs at that time. Would be the way that I would ask that question. And Lovely. and I suppose the reason why I'm, I'm being a bit shady about it is is because. What you've got to worry about is is is, is drowning. So, so what we can't yeah. do is just open it to everyone. And so you've got to think, well, is this something that only you can do? Or is there actually another organisation which could do this just as well? So whether that's the CMHT or IAP services or, or whatever other links you've got in your local area, is there another area which ought to be doing this? And you could continue to, to support the family in a different way. So perhaps that particular intervention would be better off be, coming from a, a different area, but you could still support the dad and the mom together yeah. okay thank you okay oh and that's what uh, samantha said that's yeah sign. Could, yes I, I agree samantha yes they could be signed place fry up yeah uh rose waters has got her hand up hi um thank you i was just going to comment on, on jenny's um previous comment about the 12 to 24 months um so what i've advised my teams in kent is because 
although we haven't had the investment yet come through um, for the long-term planning ambitions of being to recruit, I have said that any women that we've got on our case are currently um, that may be getting to that 12-month period, but however, we're uncomfortable at, about discharging them either completely or, or onto a CMHT. Um, I, I've asked them to look on a case-by-case -case basis, and whilst we have, you know, if we do have capacity, to keep them on, because that is our ambition, and that's probably something that we're going to address as, as, as you know, one of the first things that we do. Um, so I just think, you know, it will be sensible at the moment, especially as people have increased anxiety around COVID, um, to keep those women on. Obviously, we'll, we'll have to look at capacity and make sure that we can continue to the, do that for as long as we can. Um, but that's in despite not actually having any of the further investment yet. Yeah, so I agree. So, so that's exactly what I would like to do in Birmingham. But I think you have to balance the two bits together, don't you? So unless you've actually got the additional investment, our teams are just going to drown. <laughs> they're they're going to struggle yeah. because um, we expect there to be an increase in demand anyway. So if we suddenly expect there increase in demand and we're going to increase it by increasing the amount of time with accept referrals for, then that's actually going to have quite a big impact on on the caseload and then you've got to ask about the quality of care that patients are going to receive if they're accessing our care at, at that point and so we do need to make sure that we we can expand our services to, to meet those needs as well i don't think there's an awful lot of capacity to do to just do it i think it does need some support from commissioners to make sure that we can actually expand the team to enable us to do that but i do think it should be prioritized because i think there will be a whole cohort of women who potentially could miss out yeah okay thank you uh, Samantha, you've got your hand up. Hello, it's Sam from the Berkshire team. Um, I was just curious to see about other teams and how they're getting on because our average referral rate prior to COVID was between 80 and 100 a month. It then went down to between 60 and sort of 70 for uh, April and May. And then in June, at last count yesterday, we had 113 and we are drowning just as you've said we are we've been doing overtime in the evenings at weekends it has just been quite overwhelming so i'm just curious to hear about other services really yeah I, when you said that i just realized what an appalling image that is isn't it of drowning i'm so sorry but um yeah i think we do feel extraordinarily busy don't we and i think what your experience has been reflected across the country that we are now in that overcompensation phase where we're compensating for, for the decrease in referrals for a long period of time. And now we're, we're, we're going the other side and we're, we're, we've, we've got too many referrals, if you like. So, so I think I think that's in keeping with the anecdotal experience that we're getting from, from across the country. I don't know whether anybody's still not receiving more referrals, but it might be. It'd be interesting if you put in the chat box if that is still if that's not happening in your area to some extent. The other thing I was just going to say is that the actual referrals are fairly appropriate. There's, you know, they're coming through and they are incredibly complicated. Um, so it's not that we're receiving more inappropriate referrals. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a similar experience, certainly in, in Birmingham, but yeah, and, and everywhere else. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Susan, I think you've got your hand up. Thank you. Um, it's just in terms of, so I'm um, professional lead for children and families in Hampshire. And um, I was just in terms of where health visiting role in the maternal mental health service. Now, I really do understand that perinatal mental health is for the moderate and more severe. But is there any potential where we should be joining in the conversation and discussing pathways and criteria? What, what does that sort of look like? Where do we kind of sit? Yeah, definitely. So, so I think it's really important that, that, that they fit together. So, so we should be working hand in glove, really, shouldn't we? So if you've got your pathway, that, that your pathways need to fit in with the, the mental health pathways and vice versa, so that we've got a clear lines of communication to make sure that we can be giving information to you guys and you can be giving information to us, uh, but also making sure that people can be referred up and down as, as necessary. So, um, so yeah, so I think that they do need to work really closely together. If you think about as seeing up to 10% of women, then it does mean that, that there, there is going to be more and more of an overlap. There will be more women who, who will be having quite substantial input from you and input from us. And so, so we need to make sure that they, those two bits are tied together. Is that something you've done locally, Susan? Is there a 
uh, we have a pathway. We work um, quite. We've got a um, specialist health visitor, perinatal and mental health health visitor, who is working very closely with the um, perinatal mental health team here. Um, so I guess it's just that continuation of when the funding comes in and those sort of things. Because I was sort of thinking, well, we're very clear on when to ref. Well, we we th we've got referral guidance for when to refer under one, but it's opening up about well, what happens. Who do we submit for over? over one what is the criteria and that sort of thought process yeah. so you definitely need well i was going to say you need to be in the same room but i don't suppose you do anymore you need to be in the same teams meeting to make sure that um the voice of health is doing is definitely loudly and clearly heard to make sure that the, the two pathways map onto each other and, and work really okay yeah. thank you thanks susan tracy hi tracy how are you hi just yeah good thank you Nice to see everyone on this call. For anyone that I used to work with when I was in Giles team who doesn't know, I'm now the program manager for the NMS in Kent and Medway. So for those that I used to work with in other capacities, I recognise a lot of names on the screen of when I um, was in Giles team. Just sort of mentioned that so you weren't confused why I was asking Giles a question I should know the answer to. Um, yeah, I just wanted to on the um, maternal mental health clinics and the timeline. Mm. Um, is it definite that kind that timeline will move forward a culture? Is that still to be decided? And um, when do you think the application process will start and how much notice will we have of it when it does kick off? Yeah, so so thanks, Tracy. So so it's still to be decided, really, I suppose, is, is the honest answer. I think we're going to we're becoming increasingly optimistic that it can happen. So my real worry was that nobody would have the capacity to do this and that everybody would be um, transformationed out and thinking we can't, we can't do more. Um, but what we're hearing is that there are actually quite a few areas across the country who are quite keen to still progress or indeed had already started some of this progression work and therefore it's really important that they continue with that and just need the additional funding to help them to do it. So so for those areas then, then they're, they're, they're quite keen to go as soon as possible. Um, I think this, the final sign off as to, to when it will actually happen hasn't happened, um, but I'm optimistic it will happen soon. You know NHS England very well, Tracy, so you know that I we will give know. you very yes. little notice whatsoever and mm. we'll expect you to do a whole mountain of work in a very short space of time. <laughs> I'm really sorry. That does, uh, yeah, I know it's not That's funny, sad. and I know it's. I know that we're asking people to do an awful lot, but but that there does might seem be to people be people on the call laughing now that I'm sat on the other side of the table <laughs> because I do know what it's like. Um, and then yeah. just England, how short the notice is. Yeah, so, so I think that, that, that will happen. And I think the reason it happens though, Tracy, is so that we can get things out quickly. So I think once it takes so long to get approved yeah. to do something, yeah. that once it is approved, then quick, go, 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 yeah. go, yeah. and get it done. So um, I think the answer to it then is to make sure you've got a plan as clear as possible now yeah. as to what you would want to implement and then be able to transfer that onto the application form. The, um, our network lead in KSS mentioned that um, there was some draft kind of paperwork that outlined more of the details and requirements and she wondered whether she could share that with interested areas just so that we know we're compare, um, preparing for the right type of thing and that what we're preparing for will definitely be relevant to the criteria. Um, I, 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 I probably I probably wouldn't want to know about it, but yes, I think that'd be fine. So, uh, so I think um, we had got pretty much to the point of signing off. This is what the expression of interest form is going to look like. We'd got really close to it. So I think whatever that draft is that they've got is probably as close to it as it's going to be. So it probably is worth having a look at. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Giles. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you so much, Giles. We really appreciate your time this morning. A really informative presentation and lots of questions and further discussion, I'm sure, will come from it. So thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jenny at this point. So hi, everyone. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce Yelena from the Birmingham team. Um, I've seen this presentation before and it absolutely blew my mind in terms of looking at the need between 12 and 24 months. As we all think about going into that new area and, and who those women might be, um, I think it's it, this is just such an interesting piece of work that, that Yelena's team have done. Um, to 
to really unpick what the need might be. So I'm not, I won't say anything else at this stage. I'll hand over to Yelena. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jenny, and um, and thanks for inviting me to uh, to join your meeting. And uh, this is the work that we've done pre-COVID, uh, looking at the modeling for long-term plan. And uh, uh, we had uh, we took advantage of some of the collaborations we had with the strategy unit. Um, so I'll show you how we try to use big data to inform our thinking about how to plan uh, for um, expansion of our services. So if I could have the next slide, please. So this was done in collaboration with the strategy unit and particularly Jake Parsons, who's done uh, who's done the analysis. So could I have the next slide, please? So this is just a bit about the background that I think everyone on this call uh, is aware of. But uh, what we wanted to uh, look at is what are the numbers of women who are currently using mental health services between 12 and 24 months? Because uh, we didn't really have any idea in terms of numbers what these are. Uh, we also wanted to look at um, IAPT data, so not just focusing on women that are seen in secondary mental health services, but how many women in perinatal period are seen in IAPT and whether we can think of some new collaborative way of working with them, because uh, as, as everyone in this call knows, but there are two ambitions. One is really increasing quite significantly number of women seen up to 10% of a birth population and also uh, making sure that we uh, see women not only within only first postnatal year, but up to 24 months. So if I could have the next slide, please. So we've uh, uh, used uh, big data. We've used NHS digital databases. So the strategy unit has a collaboration agreement with the NHS digital, but I find it quite fascinating because the, for England, uh, we can use this data to really give us much better information about the local needs. Uh, of wherever we are in England. So what you can do with these databases is link them. So what Jake's done is that from one database, which is called Acute Inpatient Dataset, he identified women who gave birth in hospital. So and linked that database to mental health data services data set that gives us information about women who use secondary mental health services, but also to IAP data set. And that's what uh, uh, NHS Digital allows uh, the organization that work with them to do because uh, they're pseudonymized um, linkages. So there is no, um, the data is still confidential. We don't know anything about who these women are. We don't have any uh, identifiable information, but we can use it to plan the services. So we were able to identify women who've given birth and then look at their service use within 24 months after they've given birth. And the cohort that we used was uh, from January to July 2017, because that was uh, that date, that cohort would then uh, um, allow us to explore 24 months post, uh, post giving birth. So if I could please have the next slide. And the next one. <laughs> so uh, this is the the graph that shows uh, the first mental health contact during the perinatal period. So uh, this is somewhat, uh, we've done this for Birmingham Solical uh, STP. So uh, it looks from pregnancy, so that's this uh, minus nine, <laughs> that's what it refers to. So it looks at antenatal period, it looks as the first postnatal year, it looks as the second postnatal year. I just have to um, uh, draw your attention that months 23rd and 24th data are not completely accurate because for uh, about half of the women we did not have full data because of uh, follow up for 24 months the last two months the data was still not part of the NHS digital database so the when whenever you see an artificial drop at 23 and 24 months it's not it's not the reality it is just because of the uh, of the problem with the data but overall it does not make much of a difference but um, specifically for months 23 and 24 please do not interpret it as as a sudden drop because that's not happening but what we can see from this uh, data is that in Birmingham and Solihull we do um, most of women are referred in the antenatal period but I think that's historically how our services can function because our perinatal service has really close link with maternity so I think that women are identified uh, quite early on but what is, I think, quite important is to, to have a look at a postnatal period and to notice that these are the women getting into contact with mental health services for the first time. So this does not involve women who are in CMHTs and then 
become pregnant and then are referred to us because they're already in the system. These are women who are accessing system for the first time in a perinatal period. And you can see that there, that there is some month to month variability, but not significant drop between month eight and month 22 actually in month and 22 there is a spike that can be yeah, for various reasons but there does continue to be a significant need in a second postnatal year and that's what we need to consider when we when we look at expanding services so could i have the next slide please And uh, so in Birmingham and Solihull, we are talking about 7,597 women who gave birth in this period. I think it's important because uh, if we want to look at, at uh, calculating some of the percentages. So the first, the, the chart on the left shows women in contact with mental health services. And I think it's interesting because there's obviously a spike antenatally, and these are probably women who've had previously severe mental illness or for the ones that we are worried about but it actually uh, who do well postnatally so we do not keep them uh, keep them on in our service but if they're well enough discharge them but again in a postnatal period there is no significant cutoff at 12 months it does continue the need uh, the women in contact with services continues to be quite uh, uh, the same at a month uh, uh, six as well at a month uh, 16 17 etc so again months 23 and 24 it's uh, it's artificial drop off so don't please don't take that into account but there does seem to be a continuous need into a second postnatal year so the, on the left it is a number of women with contact with mental health services and the bar chart on the right shows number of contacts as we'd expect the highest number of contacts is um, af around birth so uh, with the uh, given that we particularly work with women who are at high risk of becoming unwell postnatally, that's understandable, then it drops off. But there is another peak at, uh, at around 15 months, 14, 15 months, and uh, we do not know why exactly that's the case, but we do wonder whether that's with uh, there's a time when maternity leaves ends, when women go back to work, when life does become <laughs> more stressful times. But But overall, I guess there are variations from month to month. The, the number of contacts does continue to be quite significant into the second postnatal year. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And then what we also wanted to look at is um, how intense are these contacts? So we know that women continue to uh, be in contact with mental health services into the second postnatal year. So we provisionally, or Jake provisionally, uh, split it into low intensity support and that's less than five contacts during perinatal periods so these are usually women who would be assessed and then either uh, need a bit of support or um, where we signpost them to primary care services or, or voluntary sector or IAPT. Then the one with moderate intensity so from five to thirty and the one with high intensity support so more than thirty contacts in the perinatal period. This would be usually women who needed admission or home treatment teams or quite intense support. So could we please have the next slide? So this does gives us information about uh, how many of women who received support in these three defined stages needed low, moderate and, uh, and high intensity. And again, we see that women who are receiving support from 12 to 24 months, so it's a bit less than a third, about 29%, but uh, the, the proportion is not too different than in antenatal or postnatal period. So majority in this group are receiving moderate intensity, some are receiving low intensity, but again, number of women are receiving high intensity support. So um, when we looked at, uh, at Birmingham data uh, and, and we looked at the percentage of women, so if we did expand to, uh, um, to receive referrals up to 24 months, that would be additional 1% in terms of access rate. So not that much, but actually in terms of the contacts, in terms of the, the intensity, it is it, it would be it is quite significant. So I think this is definitely women out there in a second postnatal year who need our help. But I think also we need to be realistic about the intensity of support that that cohort would require. So they are it, it's quite similar to the to actually first postnatal year. And if we could have a look at the next slide, please. And uh, and this is about the number of contacts delivered. So uh, again, we see that in a uh, 12 to 24 months, it is still quite significant number of contact that is that is delivered, both low intensity, moderate intensity, but also high intensity. So could we have a next slide, please? So uh, 
when in Birmingham, when we looked at where, how do we plan for long term plans? So how do we also make sure that we see more women who are with moderate to severe mental illness who are in a second postnatal year? And but also how do we see other women who we are not seeing at the moment with a possibly uh, not moderate to severe mental illness, but uh, who haven't had their parent infant uh, mental health needs assessed because we have very well developed perinatal services, um, perinatal life services in Birmingham, but uh, there is no screening for parent infant difficulties within this cohort and uh, as consequently the, the needs are not identified. So we have the plan was that we will work with um, IAP services and um, and see whether they feel that some of their women, maybe the one uh, who, who need a lot of support, actually would be better catered for in our team. But also whether for women that they are working with in terms of mod mild to moderate maternal illness, there probably is a cohort there that has unidentified need in terms of additional parent infant work, in terms of bonding work that we could then uh, uh, then support with additional work once that aspect of uh, uh, of long term plan is embedded with our service, because that's one of the flexible um, uh, flexible targets to uh, increase uh, access to psychological therapy, particularly, I think, to parent uh, parent infant work. But that can also work in terms of increasing um, access rate. That uh, that is one our fixed target. So this is the chart that illustrates um, uh, again for Birmingham and Solihull uh, women in the birth cohort that had their first eye obsession. Uh, as you can see, the uh, very few women had their first eye obsession around the time they, they give birth. And it's interesting, it's quite different. And uh, when you look at the contacts within the secondary service, the spike is around giving birth because these are women that we follow up and uh, that we are concerned about. But actually, in terms of first eye obsession, naturally, this is not a time when women would be uh, seeing and assessed, but uh, it does uh, go up quite sharply after the first uh, postnatal month. And as you can see, it continues to be quite consistent with first uh, with the first and second postnatal year. Again, data for 23rd and 24 months are not reliable. Could we have a next slide, please? Um, could we have a next slide, please? Oh, yes, yes, thanks a lot. Oh, <laughs> apologies, the one before, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is uh, as on the left. It shows about women in contact with IAP services. Again, there's a drop around the time they give birth, but actually the number of women in contact with IAP services goes up in the first uh, six, seven months and then does continue to be uh, uh, to be uh, significant. There is a month to month variation. And again, there's a drop around 13 months. And and I do wonder whether there's a time when women go back to work and it's more difficult to to fit um, starting eye up sessions at that time. And there's probably a drop off in the in the attendance. But uh, the need apart from that drop, the need is there. So the eye up is seeing quite a significant number of uh, a number of women in this perinatal period. And then with the number of contacts, uh, it's on the uh, on the right again. Drop around the time women give birth, but then another spike here around eight months. But uh, month to month variation can be uh, can be for number of reasons. So I think what's important is to look at the trend. But uh, uh, in terms of the number of contacts that women have with IAPT, there is a need for obviously for them to be in contact for up to. 24 four months and that need does seem to be slightly reduced toward the end, but again, still quite significant. So if I could have the next slide, please. So what we wanted to look at is that from from women who are seen in IAPT, how many needed really intense sessions? I have to just say that this is not the same low and moderate and high intensity is not the same as the IAPT defines. This is how Jake defined just for the purpose of this analysis. So that low intensity would be less than three therapy sessions, moderate from three to ten, and high intensity, ten or more therapy sessions. And I think that uh, again, this would be in collaboration with all the IAPT services and uh, uh, um, with us. Um, working together on a local perinatal pathway. But one option is that whether the women who have who need high intensity support may be, and I'm just saying maybe in better uh, uh, suited for perinatal mental health services that are expanded and likewise for women with low and moderate intensity, whether there are any bonding difficulties that we can uh, contribute to as a uh, as perinatal teams once we have parent infant work embedded within our teams. So can we have a next slide, please? Could we have the next slide, please? 
Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So uh, this is a number of women who received support with these three uh, defined stages of extended perinatal period. And as you can see that compared to antenatal period is only nine months, so it is uh, it is shorter. But you know, in a second postnatal year, actually the number of women was higher than in a first postnatal year for IAP. So the, the need is definitely there. And uh, again, high intensity is similar in a second year as uh, as in the first um, in the first postnatal year. And can we look at the next slide, please? Oh. I think there was uh, apologies. I think there was one uh, uh, one more slide that um, that just shows. I'll, I'll tell you the numbers. That about uh, two point five percent of women accessed IAP services. Uh, in second postnatal year. So just going back to our target of a 10% 10, 10 of access rate. So out of birth population in Birmingham and Solihull, about 2.5% accessed, uh, uh, um, accessed services within this period. So and out of those, some were high intensity. So I think it's just important. Uh, we we have not uh, we've taken this information and are in collaborate are now in discussions with our IAP services and our parent infant uh, team in particular how to improve that whether uh, particularly how better to identify women with bonding uh, bonding difficulties. We are considering expanding uh, and accepting referrals up to eighteen months uh, and. Uh, rather than up to 24 months, because when we looked at numbers and looked at intensity, that's what we think is realistic. So um, this this data is just informative. It certainly does not uh, uh, give us any definite answers. But if possible, I would, yeah, uh, be. <laughs> uh, I would try to encourage you to try and do local analysis, or at least use ours for for that thinking. I mean, we we did a similar analysis for our one of the neighbouring STPs, and it was it was similar. It didn't show any. Uh, any huge differences apart from that we in Birmingham get uh, referrals antenatally and I think that's because of the specificities of our service but in terms of 12 to 24 months the picture is quite similar but um, I guess what I took from it is that we can't do all we can't see women up until 24 months and offer all the aspects of the of the long-term plan unless we compromise care somewhere so I think we have to be realistic as to what we can offer and offer that of good quality and uh, and I think that such local data does give you the best uh, the best possibility to do that uh, to do that fairly. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Helen. Oh, we're, oh we're, I've I've got a really bad echo. Sorry, it's quite hard to um, to talk when you keep hearing yourself. But yeah, that that. Um, still amazes me i think in my head that um post 12 months the need would start to sort of tail off and to see it um being at the same sort of level plus that level of intensity I, it definitely shows that we need to find a way of 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 um working collaboratively with with IAPT and, and imaginatively too possibly you know where that they might be doing some work but we might be adding in the a nursery nurse to look at the relationship or something like that so I think in in the brave new world I think hopefully a lot of artificial boundaries between services will start to come down and we can be a bit more imaginative and collaborative um, are you OK to take a few questions if the audience have any, Eleanor? Yeah, OK. Yeah. So if I if I throw it over to the um, attendees then for any questions. I think Becky's got her hand up, Jenny. I can't I can't see that. Sorry, Sorry. I'll let you, you know that. So, uh, Becky, that. Can we go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Becky. I'm the pharmacist for the Berkshire team. Um, I just wanted to check, really, your second lot of data was based on IAPT. The first lot of data that was merged with, was that merged with perinatal team input and MBU input as well? Uh, the, the first lot of data is secondary mental health services in general. Okay, so, okay, so that included CMHTs as well? Yes, it includes, uh, yes, it includes uh, yeah, all the women that are um, 
the the reason was that some of the data is from 2017 and i think it depends uh, on uh, i mean i think in birmingham most of the areas had perinatal teams but mm -hmm. this uh, the first slot is about women where onset of contact with services is in um uh, perinatal period so um all of them should be with perinatal teams once perinatal teams are well developed in all areas. So it did not include women who were already under CMHTs and then became pregnant. So it did not include those women. It included women whose onset of contact with secondary mental health services in perinatal period. Okay, so nice. uh, again, uh, we can't be 100 percent sure, but most of those uh, would be looked after by perinatal teams. OK, thank you. I just wanted to clarify because I think I was a bit unclear during your talk, which was really interesting, thank you, um, whether the women who were receiving high intensity IAPT support would actually sort of qualify for secondary care mental health input or whether IAPT were managing those women sufficiently was sort of what, I, did you manage to kind of gather that information? Uh, we didn't we didn't look into whether those women were then referred to uh, um, uh, to secondary mental health services. But I think just from clinically, from my experience, we do get we do not get many who've had full treatment in IAPT and then are referred to us. We generally get most from referral from IAPT as once they've assessed them and then uh, and then referred. But yes, we haven't looked at that, so I can't I can't say exactly. But I, I must say that I was personally very surprised as to how that there is quite um, a number of women who they are working with quite intensively in perinatal period and and particularly from 12 to 24 months they they do hold so many so many women in perinatal period so that's um yeah i think for further planning uh, was but a bit of surprise surprise for me mm. thank you um i think gisella you've got your hand up Hi, yes, um, thank you. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, so I am one of the clinical service managers of IAPT in the Surrey area, so further down in the country. And um, my question is around the um, 18 or 24 months, because you're saying if your team are going to try and push it uh, to, 20, to 18 months, although the data is showing really the high need in IAPT for your figures up there, for 24 months. At the moment, we prioritise obviously um, pregnant women um, and up to a year, including their partners in our service and see them for treatment within uh, two weeks. So um, for us, I don't know whether the government has actually said, no, you've got to do it now for 18 months or 24, because based on this data, it's quite difficult to ignore, even if something hasn't already come out in writing, because really these women really need it after that time. and. I think in the last three weeks, I've picked up two women just over the 13, mm. say 12 months. They were like 13, 13 months. And I thought, you know what, we should be prioritising them. And I've done that, made that decision clinically. But I don't know whether we should, you know, uh, do it for the for all of the women. I think, to, to be honest, this was all, um, I think at the moment, yeah, like the rest of the health service in sort of uh, is still in the pandemic and a bit of a crisis mode but certainly uh, in my opinion I think any um, any plans we have to make very closely with local IAPS teams because that should be one one pathway and uh, I personally think that certainly in Birmingham we have a really high mobility and I do think that some of the women that IAPS has been seeing are quite complex and that maybe with once we have more psychology support within perinatal teams that probably we should be seeing those most complex women from IAPS but on the other hand IAPT is doing a great job and I think it's important to keep in mind that there are lots of advantages not coming to secondary mental health services but being looked after by IAPT. But where I think where we particularly can work together is um, working with IAPT teams at almost screening for bonding difficulties and then adding on to that. So um, not necessarily, I mean, taking over when it's clinically appropriate and felt by both teams that that's the right thing, but, um, but adding on in terms of the bonding work. I think then we can... Uh, really enhance both the perinatal IAPT and um, and achieve these ambitions from the from the long term plan. But the numbers are significant. I was quite surprised as to that there is in so in terms of IAPT, there's no <laughs> reduction in in a need in a 12 to 24 months at all. So the yeah, women do need need help. Thanks. I'm really informed by that. And the other question was for Sarah Fishburne for the Kent, Surrey and Sussex or Surrey. Is it possible to have a similar study pulled where the data is linked and you can track the women like this study? 
Is there any chance? I, think that that, uh, I mean, I, I'm quite happy to um, because Jake Parsons was he's the, is the analyst who we worked with, and he's uh, he's a psychologist by the background, and he's done now quite a lot. We've done quite a lot of work with him in perinatal. So uh, again, I. <laughs> I do not promote anyone, but I know that uh, he can then give you some details as to how to do that. And uh, it certainly wasn't very complicated. I mean, we've managed to do this uh, fairly quickly. And uh, and I found the process as a, as a clinician really informative that uh, these are the data that are available to all of us. And I think, unfortunately, they're mainly looked uh, the people who ultimately look at this data are generally commissioners and and people in a management, which I think is really important. But mm -hmm. I think that we should be looking at them and that we should jointly make the best use of of these data. That I mean, if this is available from the NHS Digital. It's great that we can link this data, and I think we need to make the most out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. I'm sure that's been real food for thought for everybody. Um, and certainly in terms of planning for um, our new look services, it's so important to to not make assumptions about what's out there, but to actually crunch the numbers and um, and find out for sure what, what we're dealing with. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you. You're very welcome. OK, so we're just going to move on um, to the last bit now. Um, so we are i'm going to hand back over to liz because we need you to do a little bit of work now okay over to you liz thank you jenny can we have the next slide please right so we asked on the webinar um a fortnight ago how you would like us to proceed going forward whether you wanted to us to adjust the regularity of these um webinars or not um, so we are going to ask you to vote and hopefully the technology is going to work in terms of whether you would like us to continue holding the webinars on a fortnightly basis or move to a monthly basis. Now, in a minute, Ryland's going to put up the voting system into the chat box. For those of you who can access that, please vote via that. If you have problems and your vote doesn't get registered, then once those votes are in, we will ask you to then, um, if you haven't been able to vote, to put it in the chat box. But I'm just going to ask anybody whose vote doesn't doesn't work um, to hold your horses for the moment. So, Ryland, can we have the first question in the chat box, please? So. If you press, um, if you tick on whether you want it fortnightly or monthly and submit your vote, then it will show it um, below in a percentage for us. So for those of you who can access that, please, can you give your vote now? It's gone wrong. <laughs> oh, OK. Is anybody being able to submit their vote? No. OK, right. So our technology <laughs> that we were so hopeful for. OK, right. Hold your horses then, guys. Um, so it obviously isn't working. So can I ask you to. Um, Ryland, could you just put can I ask nobody else to comment at the moment? And Ryland, can I just ask you to post fortnightly? and then monthly, and then ask people to give a thumbs up to whichever they would like. OK, are people able to put a thumbs up onto whichever response they would like? OK, no, that's not working either. <laughs> the joys of our technology, OK. So just put in the text box or verbalise what you would like. Month monthly is coming up strongly at the moment. Yeah, can we? Yeah. OK, so we've got mainly monthly. We've got a couple of people commenting on fortnightly. 
what what we're thinking is that if we go monthly for these webinars that we will reach out to particular groups of you maybe in between to um to have more discussions at a local level about the long-term plan so i guess so the people that have commented on fortnightly have said that they're they're sort of reasoning is because of the move out of covid still do you, of those that have all said monthly do you feel that you're in a position that um monthly works and you're or or do we want monthly from a future date keep up to date but also happy sorry just reading the comments okay so does jenny's proposal sound like a happy compromise of monthly kind of for core information and then reaching out to specific groups on a more regular basis as and when required. OK. OK, so it looks like we've got agreement. Sorry, the voting didn't work on that. Um, so Jenny and I will go away and plan that. Um, we were also going to ask, which probably will be disastrous to try and do in the chat box now, but we were going to ask um, how you would like us to prioritise the LTP um, deliverables in terms of focusing our future webinars on. Um, Ryland, I don't know if you have that ready to put in the chat box um or whether i can put it in and then just people can see what the options were can we do that yeah. lovely and then we, what we were going to ask you all to do is to say what you would like us to um prioritize and some of them we might be able to group together but of um maternal mental health services dads and partners um increasing uh, the scope from 12 to 24 months, reaching the access target rate in terms of the increased um, number of women to be seen or psychology and personality disorder. What would you like us to take as the hot topic for our next one? Thank you guys, please put it in. What we'll do is if you put it in the chat box, we will collate as to what has the largest vote and we will go with the majority. And if we can pair up a couple of things into the next webinar, we will do. OK, I'll let you carry on doing that in the chat box. And yeah. um, just to also say that we will be doing. Um, we will um, set aside a separate webinar slash workshop for those that are looking to be early implementers for um, maternal mental health services to go through the paperwork and everything as soon as we have um, kind of the launch from the national team as well. OK, so I'll let people comment in the chat box. Can we just move on to the next um, slide? So this is really for information. So last time we asked you if you would give us your um, great bits of work that you've been doing, your innovations in terms of um, innovations during COVID, but also what you wanted to continue and amplify um, as we move into this next phase. And can I have the next slide, please? So we have collated all your really good elements of innovation um, that you gave us last time. And so we've put it in a slide so we can share that when these slides go out and um, you've got contact details, but you can come back to us if you need uh, further information about those individuals to get in touch. OK, next slide. Thank you. Um, so we wanted them to think a little bit about um, restart. And I think Giles raised a very good point first thing that actually things haven't been completely on hold. There's been loads of work going on, but thinking about how we um, focus on some of the different elements of, of LTP in a slightly different way of working going forward. Um, and so again, we were going to ask to um, for some of your ideas and innovations in terms of this 
um, going forward. And Jenny, I don't know if you also wanted to chip in on this point. I appreciate we've got limited time today, so it will be something that we will focus on going forward as we take the individual topic okay. areas of the LTP. Um, I think one of the things that I was curious to know in terms of, of restarting, in terms of things you've had to stop focusing on because of COVID. So thinking about Yelena's um, presentation, did you, were there any sort of things that you thought, oh, it would be really good to know that to implement the long term plan? Any bits of hard digging or surveys that you had in mind to do before um, COVID struck? Things that you might have to sort of remember about now and um, get back in touch with. So, you know, were you having some useful meetings of, of, of across the perinatal pathway? Had, are, are there things like that that need to be restarted? So um, if there's if there's anything that springs to mind, do pop it in the chat box or or um, come and, you know, just ask, tell us. And we will also just following up from the survey, we will collate all the information you've given us in terms of the suggestion, in terms of the regularity and also the topics. But we may well send out with the slides a survey mark and key just to confirm that if anybody's had difficulties giving their feedback today, you will also have the opportunity to do it via that means as well. Um, in the last three minutes, I just wanted to mention um, this. So um, you'll have the details included in the slides, but this um, there is a Windrush leadership programme for nurses and midwives. Um, and the closing date is the 17th of July, so there's not long to apply, but um, looks like potentially a really good leadership program um, for aspiring leaders um, and just wanted to really flag it in case people haven't seen that. Um, the details are there so you can go and get further information, um, but just wanted to share really. And I've just looked at one of the questions from Helen. So our proposal at the moment is we will continue to do these meetings remotely. So the guidance from both NHS England and Health Education England, that is that at least till September, October, we would be expecting to do remotely. And I think with our geography and our coverage um, to enable all of you to join, I think that probably works best and is easier fitting into your other schedules. Um, but as we go forward, I'm sure we will look to do some face to faces when um, meetings, when eventually we can all meet in person again. OK, so just to remind you all, the slides and resource pack will be available after um, the meeting. Um, the recordings will also be made available and the link will come out to you in an email. And as always, if you didn't receive this directly and you want to be on the circulation list, please email the admin team on the email address given on the screen and we will add you to the contacts list. OK, thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions. Um, we will send out the next date of the webinar, which looks by the feedback that we've been given that it will be in a month's time. But we will confirm that and um, amend your calendar invites accordingly. Thank you very much for your time today.